Thank you, everyone. Okay, so I had a book come out recently called um, College Disrupted, The Great Unbundling of Higher Education. And uh, I'm running around the country speaking to groups of college presidents and provosts, and sometimes they use me as the guy they, you know, they trot out to, to be the agent provocateur, uh, as it were, throw tomatoes at, say this is a, uh, you know, view of the, view of the future. Um, and I think a lot of the themes you're going to hear actually were, um, uh, you know, you heard earlier uh, in the day, the beginning of the day from, uh, from, from Zoe Baird at the Markle uh, Foundation. Uh, we'll try and do this in a lively, uh, a lively way. And then we have a terrific panel um, who are going to respond to some of the challenges, uh, tell you how they're sort of navigating some of the challenges uh, of, the, uh, of the current marketplace and then future challenges that we, that we see. Um, so we're going to start uh, with, uh, you know, I think, um, some of the, the challenges uh, that you're seeing uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in, in the market. So I talk in the book, uh, the book about three different crises uh, that, we're, that we're facing. The first being the crisis, the crisis of data. So there's not enough data. Uh, we, we, we've, uh, you know, I, it, I talk about uh, money college uh, as the equivalent to money ball, uh, right? The, uh, the Michael Lewis uh, book, Brad Pitt uh, movie, and money ball, uh, you know, you, you, they really didn't know uh, how to predict uh, performance uh, in, in, in baseball. Uh, and then they realized that on-base percentage is actually a great predictor of runs, which predicts wins. And so let's, let's invest uh, in on-base uh, percentage. What is the on-base percentage uh, of, uh, of higher education? We're literally in the first inning, uh, if you will, of trying to figure that out. We've, we've got some, some real progress uh, over the last couple of months with the, you know, you heard uh, the undersecretary talk about the new college scorecard, uh, for example, where for the first time we have real income data, IRS income data being correlated uh, to inputs. Um, and that's data that even US News has said they're probably gonna take into consideration uh, now. So that's, that, that's real data that you may have heard of this Brookings uh, Institution value add uh, ranking, uh, where for the first time they're trying to control for inputs and actually figure out uh, what value add uh, a college is providing and ranking uh, on, that, on that basis. Now, interestingly, there have been some surveys recently. Uh, uh, students, millennials, uh, are not, uh, do not value uh, rankings, even U.S. news rankings, uh, very highly uh, anymore. And that's, a, I think, a, a misconception that many of our institutions uh, uh, have. Um, so there is a crisis of, uh, of data. Uh, undoubtedly, you've heard of this crisis <laughs> of affordability. Uh, it's in the headlines. Uh, it's in the headlines everywhere. Um, it's just increasingly uh, difficult uh, for families uh, to afford uh, the cost of higher education. Certainly, the list price, and there's a perception uh, out there. The list prices certainly establish a, a perception, even though the net prices are significantly uh, significantly, uh, significantly lower, uh, and there's been a lot of work done uh, on, you know, the impact uh, of uh, the, this affordability crisis uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, gra graduates buying houses, uh, in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, so uh, economic, economic growth uh, directly uh, negatively impacted uh, by, uh, by, by, by affordability, and certainly satisfaction of, uh, of alumni. There was a recent uh, a, a Purdue Gallup poll that came out uh, that indicated that uh, among students uh, who came out with significant uh, debt, uh, fewer than 20% were actually very satisfied uh, with their investment uh, in college, uh, college education. Uh, so we have that, uh, that is a major uh, issue. Then I talk about uh, crisis of governance at colleges and universities. So I think there are symptoms uh, that we're seeing uh, out, out, out there. And, you know, Division I college sports, I don't know who, who here is with a Division I uh, institution, but, uh, uh, you know, today we learned that Texas A&M uh, just uh, uh, allocated uh, $74 million, uh, in student fees towards its new football uh, stadium. Uh, I'm not sure that's the best return on investment for those students who are having those dollars uh, allocated to, that, to, the, to, the new, uh, uh, to the new football uh, stadium. Uh, so there's a question of, uh, you know, uh, I, th I think in the public's mind, there, there's a legitimate question of, are these institutions really focused on uh, students? If you actually do an analysis of mission statements uh, of, uh, of, of universities, and we've done this, uh, only 10% uh, ever mention students or learning uh, in their mission statements. And often, there's so many bottom lines uh, in university mission statements, there's, there's no bottom line uh, at all, uh, effectively. Uh, and here's one example uh, of this. I'll just let you read this for a moment, if you, if you will. 
this is the, the lazy rivers or the aquatic centers that uh, institutions have been investing uh, in. Uh, and again, probably not providing a terrific return on investment uh, for, uh, for students. My favorite is the, is the last one, the uh, lazy river in the shape of the LSU uh, font. I hope no one from LSU is here, or Texas A&M for that matter. <laughs> um, and interestingly enough, uh, LSU, um, a few months ago, as the, the state was you know, uh, literally disinvesting uh, in their system of higher education, uh, the question was, would they proceed uh, with their uh, Lazy River uh, project? And the answer was, we will proceed. Bankruptcy be damned. Uh, we will be the benchmark for the next level, said the director of university uh, recreation. Qu question whether that's a, a position that really universities need to, need to fill. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I think we're beginning to see the impact uh, now. This is data from last fall. This year's hasn't come out yet, but uh, fully 70% of small and mid-sized private and public institutions failed to meet their budget enrollment uh, goal. Uh, it was a real, a real, a real challenge. Uh, and I think increasingly uh, what we're seeing uh, is, and we're obviously for profits, uh, you know, enrollments down by more than half over the last uh, five years. Law schools, uh, we're seeing enrollment declines of over 50% uh, again over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, so students are uh, beginning to ask the question, what is the return on our tuition uh, invested. As Mitch Daniels, um, the, uh, the president of, of Purdue says, uh, you know, uh, increasingly people aren't taking our word for it uh, anymore uh, in, in, in higher education. So um, I'm gonna go quickly through this. Uh, we we, we talk, uh, talk about uh, the impact of technology, the technology is having. Uh, on, uh, on, 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 on higher education. Uh, I think it's having a, a significant impact uh, already. Uh, on campus, uh, there's a consensus uh, around what, uh, how to improve uh, education, uh, on-campus education using technology through not just a flipped classroom, but a dynamic, a dynamic classroom. Um, and then uh, in terms of how technology can uh, improve uh, learning uh, at a distance through online uh, learning. Uh, presumably, there are three ways in which that can happen, right? Increase accessibility, improve affordability, improve efficacy. Uh, we really have only begun to see the first of that. Uh, and, and I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done on affordability and efficacy, uh, but uh, access is, is, you know, we can check that box, but uh, I don't think the others are, uh, can, be, can be checked yet. Um, I won't go into this in detail because I want to bring the panel out, uh, but uh, you know, in the book, I make the analogy of massive open online courses to the Spice Girls. <laughs> uh, they, were, they were a fad, um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, most have moved on uh, from that. They were a bit of a distraction. There's a, potentially a PR benefit for the institution, but there's really no business model uh, there. Uh, you know, th if, if you think about what technology should be able to do for, for colleges and universities, uh, in terms of improving affordability, addressing efficacy, and improving student outcomes, uh, you know, it should, it should do two things. The first is, is simplify, right? Uh, if, if you think about uh, higher education, uh, it is a complex product, and, and I, I would argue it's the most complex product that's purportedly designed for the mass market, which is not to say that it shouldn't be difficult to complete a degree program. Of course, it should be rigorous, and it should require a great level of crea uh, uh, significant creativity and so forth, but literally the interaction with the institution around enrollment, transfer credit, financial aid, and so forth. That interface, uh, if you will, has not been upgraded <laughs> in the way that, for example, Netflix has significantly upgraded our ability to interact with that data-rich environment. In this data-rich environment, uh, we're still dealing with a very old, old interface uh, here. Uh, one way to, uh, to improve that interface uh, is through competency-based uh, learning. Uh, that's, uh, absolutely uh, orients uh, the institution around competencies, around, uh, around the student as opposed to a uh, faculty-centric uh, model. In a competency-based model, you start with a competency, and often you're determining that in uh, conjunction with uh, an employers or groups of employers. Um, and from there, you're deriving assessments that demonstrate those competencies, and then from there, you're deriving, only then do you get into a conversation around curriculum. What curriculum then best prepares the student to take these assessments to demonstrate these competencies? So that, that significantly simplifies uh, matters because in a competency-based world, pass-fail becomes anachronistic transfer credits. What is that, right? You either have the competency 
or you don't have the competency. Right? It simplifies and improves the interface uh, for the university. So we think we, that's something that we see coming down the, coming down the road. Um, second goal, uh, you know, if in, in an online environment, how do you take um, the, uh, the, 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 what is essentially a focus by choice environment uh, and turn it into more of a controlled focus uh, 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 situation? Uh, we would argue that it's through gamification and we're seeing significant developments here in terms of gamification of curriculum, uh, as well as through uh, adaptive, uh, ad adaptive learning. <clears throat> so um, we're going to now talk about sort of how, where, where we see the market, uh, the market heading. Um, and uh, this may be a little provocative, I hope it is. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we believe we're going to see what we call a great hollowing out uh, in higher education. And by hollowing out, we mean what's happening in the retail and in the restaurant sectors as well. So in retail, you know, if you're, you know, your dollar stores are thriving, Neiman Marcus is thriving, but you wouldn't want to be JCPenney, right? <laughs> um, in the restaurant sector, you know, Chipotle, you know, we know what they do. They, they don't pretend to be any more than they, than they are. Um, fine dining is doing fine, but you know, you wouldn't want to be, uh, you know, a Red Lobster uh, or Olive Garden. Uh, for example. So those restaurants that have the accoutrement of fine dining without the quality, uh, we see is, and they are running into trouble. And some have said this is, you know, symptomatic of the decline of the middle class and so forth. Whatever it is, we see that coming into higher education as well, where institutions that have the accoutrement of excellence without the excellence are going to be in real trouble. We'll need to essentially decide what they want to be. Do they want to be premium providers? Uh, or they, will they be discounters? Will they be providing credentials essentially for the lowest possible, lowest possible cost? Um, one, one, one example uh, we want to point to and, and, and sort of emerging trend is what we call the full stack uh, higher education provider. And so think of, think of Uber. You know, what has Uber, Uber done? Before Uber came along, there were about a half dozen companies uh, that had essentially tried to uh, upend the taxi and limousine business by providing better dispatching software to, college, to, 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 to taxi uh, companies. Uh, they didn't upend the industry. They didn't disrupt it because at the end of the day, you know, customers were still sitting in the back of dirty taxis. <laughs> so you know, uh, in the same way that Microsoft, uh, you know, they, they said, OK, we're going to take this slice of the stack. We're going to take the operating system slice. We're going to take the you know, office uh, programs, we'll leave the rest of it to you know, partners and other companies. Apple, on the other hand, said we're going to take control of the full stack, everything from you know, product design to packaging to the retail uh, experience. And look what they've done with that. So Uber's done the same thing. Uber said we're going to take, we're a technology company, but we're going to take responsibility for the full stack, for the full cu customer experience. It's our supposition that at the top of the stack, for most students at your institutions, is the job, you know, is the job. And that those institutions that sort of aim to be premium full stack institutions will be those that are literally, if not, you know, placing their student in the job, you know, coming, close to very, to, coming very close to getting their student that job, which means a very clear path to that employment. And we see, we see the thirst for this in the emergence of these just-in-time providers. So primarily in the coding boot camp space, you know, coming back to my Netflix uh, example, the interfaces of these coding boot camps are clean. They're simple. Employers understand that they understand what students are getting from the experience and what competencies they're coming out with. Students understand the same thing, the clean interface. Um, so uh, you know, we see these emerging just-in-time providers. There's, there's top-up programs. On the left, you see that these are, these are programs that essentially are for students who already have degrees um, and obviously can afford to pay the additional $10,000, $20,000. But increasingly, we're going to see alternative uh, providers, alternative models, uh, year up, and so forth, where you're taking an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old with no post-secondary experience, providing them with a combination of training and, you know, employment slash internship, and literally placing them in jobs without the benefit of have having a full, you know, a multidisciplinary college or university education. So, and we can envision, uh, we can envision this model in other sectors as well. We don't think it's only relevant for IT. We think it's relevant for many industries uh, as well. So I'm going to forward here to, I think, challenge, challenges that are coming down the road, a big challenge, which is unbundling. And you heard Zoe Baird this morning talk about uh, unbundling. Um, and she may not have used that term, 
but effectively, when I, when I talk about unbundling, I mean the unbundling of the degree. Um, degrees are, you know, the default currency of the labor market, and as currencies go, they're pretty bulky, right? You know, it takes you two years, right? Zoe talked about the fact that, you know, students who come and spend a year at your institutions and then drop out, they, it's not like they're not getting anything, right? They are, they are benefiting, there are competencies that they're gaining from that experience, but the problem is that those competencies aren't being recognized because they've tried to pick up, this is, the, by the way, the currency on the, uh, the, the giant stone coins on the island of Yap. So talk about a bulky currency, <laughs> right? But in many ways, it's, it's a good, a good analogy, right? Because almost half of the students across America who try to pick up our currency, the degree, right, fail to pick it up. So it's a bulky currency. And so we see what's, what's happened in other sectors is gonna happen in higher education. So on bundling, um, for example, music. Uh, some of you are old enough to remember CDs <laughs> or even record albums. Uh, we don't buy music that way anymore. Uh, television increasingly will be interacting with individual shows and producers and talent as opposed to, you know, channels or even cable, uh, ca cable packages. A degree is a bundle. A degree is a bundle of general education, your major, library services, counseling, and so forth, and not everyone needs all of that, right? Uh, so ultimately, uh, we believe uh, that the market will uh, unbundle. And the question that I want to pose here, and I'll answer in a moment, is what will prompt that unbundling? So the currency I think we're moving to is a currency of competencies, right? And you saw this triangle, a version of this triangle that we put up this morning, where you have individuals who need competencies, employers who want competencies, and educational institutions who impart uh, competencies. And, you know, whenever I speak to a, an audience of presidents or provosts or deans, I always say, I wish we had a better term for competencies, because in the academic setting, competencies uh, have a negative connotation. They tend to uh, connote, um, you know, vocational skills, blue-collar skills, and really I mean capabilities. I mean anything that can be assessed. You know, core cognitive problem solving, critical thinking, communication skills, um, those are competencies. Uh, those are competencies too. Um, and, and the reason I'm so interested in what LinkedIn uh, is doing is because I believe LinkedIn will become the first competency marketplace. Because when uh, Alan talked this morning about an economic graph, that is actually is a competency marketplace. So here's what I mean. Today on your LinkedIn profile, you have your professional experience. Right? Um, uh, shortly, I believe, um, you, you will have not just your professional experience, but LinkedIn will ask you if you'd like them to essentially map your skills or competencies uh, for you. And it won't just be based on what you report or what your colleagues report. It'll be based on algorithmic analysis uh, of, your, uh, of your experience and maybe your transcript and maybe your SAT scores or ACT scores and maybe based on some real-time assessments that LinkedIn is delivering to you. And once you have that profile of literally hundreds of of competencies, you can do a lot with it. And that's what Alan talks about when he talks about the economic, the economic graph, right? You'll be able to say, okay, well, I wanna be an environmental engineer. Great, you know? Okay, based on our algorithmic analysis of the 5,000 jobs currently posted for that position, here are the competencies required to become an environmental, environmental engineer with some degree of confidence. Here are your competencies with some degree of confidence. And here is the quickest path uh, to, uh, to, 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 to remediating that that gap, and for many students, it won't be a four-year degree. It'll be a series of individual learning experiences, massive open online courses, assessments, and so forth. And unbundling of higher education, in our view, happens once the signal that employers receive from the competency marketplace, competency marketplace's stamp that this individual is qualified with some degree of confidence for this position, when that signal becomes stronger than the signal that they're getting, not from elite institutions, so our next panel, we have Duke and UNC, I don't think we're too worried. That's a, that signal will be very strong for a long time, in large part due to the caliber of the inputs of those students, right? Um, but once the signal from the competency marketplace is uh, as strong or stronger uh, than uh, the signal that they're getting from non-elite schools, schools that these employers haven't heard of, then employers will begin to hire the candidate out of the competency marketplace as opposed to the candidate with the degree and you get, uh, you get unbundling. Um, so we'll talk a little bit uh, about that. Uh, you heard Zoe this morning talking about sort of lifelong learning and the analogy that we make uh, is, you know, what SaaS has done to enterprise software, right? Uh, you think about the degree model, degrees 
are essentially a, a version of enterprise software, right? So five years ago, 10 years ago, the way enterprises bought software was you had to buy a huge package, right? If someone called a bloatware, you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a huge implementation, then you'd have annual maintenance fees, but you buy it once, right? Well, we have a product that people pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for, they buy once, it's called a degree. <laughs> so now you have SaaS, right? Uh, so Adobe had an enterprise product, its customers were unhappy, they said, we're gonna stop selling this enterprise product, we're gonna start selling a SaaS product, and all of our customers are gonna have to decide, you know, every month to keep buying it and just buy, pay for the functions they want, and so forth, and it was a wrenching change for Adobe to do that, but they did it. And the benefit is that they have happy customers and their customers are now lifelong customers, they have potential to be lifelong customers. So the analogy in higher ed, of course, uh, is uh, you know, more along the lines of what we, these just-in-time providers, right, these boot camps, you might come for three months, you might get some, uh, you, 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 might, you, you might, you might get some competencies, you'll have some credential, maybe not a degree. Uh, you'll go work, you'll come back. Um, so that's the model we're seeing. And, 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 and we expect that this competency environment uh, will lead to some really interesting business models, for example. So you can imagine a student with a competency profile, perhaps on LinkedIn, coming in the door of your institution, and your institution, because you're able to know sort of what competencies are required, you know, for example, for certain professions, uh, you'll be able to say, okay, you know what? Your, so, your competency profile is actually so close uh, to being a uh, sonographer, for example, in Allied Health, uh, that we're gonna give you that program for free. And maybe we'll even guarantee you a job because we have relationships with all these hospitals that need to fill these positions. So if you think about it, from time immemorial, higher education has been playing only uh, here in the top left quadrant, right? Paid programs, no guaranteed outcome. So we see a multiplicity of business models uh, arising here where institutions and providers uh, will get paid uh, in other ways as well, like for placement. And that means, uh, we think, <laughs> you know, the competition that colleges and universities need to be concerned about is probably not University of Phoenix, um, but some of these companies, because if you think about what I just described, what staffing companies do is actually not terribly distinct. And in fact, they, they, they place you, right? They give you, they, they get you the job. So in some ways, that's a superior value proposition. And in some ways, you know, we think it's possible that there may be a lot of value in actually owning that competency profile uh, as well. <laughs> I asked the question somewhat facetiously, you know, in 10 or 20 years, you know, you have a, yeah, and you hear, you know, your friends say that their daughter is earning a degree, you know, well, you look at that the same way as, for example, you'd look at that today if your friend told you that, you know, their daughter was coming out as a debutante, which is, yeah, that's kind of quaint, that's kind of old-fashioned, did she really need to do that, that's kind of expensive, and so forth. Um, you know, I, I, I want to say, you know, wait in one respect, because we have 100 million students uh, from outside the U.S. who are coming into higher education. Uh, for the first time uh, over the next uh, decade. Uh, and I think uh, after we've, we've reached unbundling uh, in this market, those students are gonna still want US degrees. Uh, so I think there's still huge, uh, huge opportunities um, uh, with, with, with our current product, our current currency degrees, to reach international students both where they are um, uh, as well as here, uh, here in the US. Uh, so hopefully that gives you, that's a quick run through, you don't need to read the book now. <laughs> uh, a quick run through sort of our view of the challenges uh, that we're facing. Uh, with that, I'd like to bring out uh, our, uh, our panel. Uh, so we've got uh, three uh, distinguished uh, uh, representatives of, uh, of, of three terrific uh, institutions. Uh, so we have Elizabeth Hogan, uh, who's Associate Dean of uh, Global Marketing at uh, Duke's uh, Fuqua School of Business. Uh, we have Terry Traub, uh, who's Executive Director of Enterprise Learning Solutions at uh, Kaplan. Uh, and then we have Michael Chinelli, who's the CMO and Associate Dean for External Communications at UNC, uh, Ken and Flagler uh, Business School. So please join me in welcoming them. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific, hopefully this mic is, oh great, it's great, we're still on. Um, well, wonderful. Uh, well, welcome, uh, all of you. It's terrific to, you. to have you here. So I've just recited a litany of challenges <laughs> that uh, our institutions are facing, and some more pressing than others, uh, for sure. Affordability, obviously, uh, is a concern, has been a concern for, for many, uh, many years. Uh, maybe we can just by, start by saying, you know, we, of, the, of the laundry list uh, of uh, challenges and complaints, which one uh, is at the top uh, of your, your list? If you could wave your magic wand and sort of have one of those uh, challenges resolved, uh, which, would, which would it be? 
I started? Oh my goodness. Um, so this whole idea of unbundling, is, which is in some sense very novel in the right. institution that I, um, there are, I would say, some elements of that that we might begin to see. So for example, um, after the financial crisis, Duke University saw that employers were perhaps not as likely to come and invest in resources to talk to the liberal arts grads, right? right. And, and there was a real concern that maybe the value of the liberal arts degree in the face of constrained resources was at risk. And so that was one of the reasons that our institution at the business school created kind of a master's of management studies for right. pre-experience folks. And that's been a phenomenally successful degree. So there is this interesting kind of slowness in academia um, that I don't think is as responsive as, as some of the things that you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Terry? It, I think we're, I mean, being in the for-profit, right. we're, we're getting it from all different sides. So we're, we're going after it at all different levels. We are doing unbundling. We are doing open college. We are working on affordability. We're working on prior learning. So we found that for us, for survival, and also just to make sure from transparency, we're working on all the different fronts, fronts pretty equally. Great, Michael. Well, I think the way I would put it is that the up, the um, the challenges in terms of technology are really presenting uh, the opportunities for for as far as I'm concerned, from my perspective as a mar chief marketing officer, there are so many new salespeople knocking on our door that five years ago, ten years ago, weren't coming to higher ed. Every company, every business model has a vertical now for EDU, and with that comes um, the challenge of trying to figure out. Should you do it? What do you do? Right. But comes also the benefit of, of making good decisions and seeing how you can innovate and get out in front, leapfrog, yep. in fact. On, on the question of affordability, uh, I mean, how, how are you or how is your institution handling that uh, head on? Uh, whether on a sort of global basis or whether on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, sort of interaction with, with applicants? So, you know, an MBA is really expensive. <laughs> and I think that that, you know, financial aid becomes one of the big fundraising priorities that we have as an institution, um, f you know, both at the business school and at the university. I mean, that's a huge focus of ours. Yeah, I would agree. I think we're fortunate in that as a, as a public university, right. um, the university itself is ranked 10 years in a row as the, most, as the greatest value in the country for public universities. The business school is somewhere in the top 10 or 12 for the MBA degree. But it's still, a, it's still a huge priority. And as we approach our, our 100th anniversary in a few years, one of the three signature fundraising initiatives is 100 MBA fellowships to allow us to further subsidize um, students who might not otherwise be able to afford that. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of focus on like working with um, the students to see what their prior learning is because you know, there's a, we have a strong feeling that a lot of what you learn outside of the school you can apply to what you're doing. And we're also working very closely with employers to do what we're calling mapping of the different work and the different training that they're doing within the organization. So we want to make sure that the students, if they have this experience outside of the academic world, we're able to recognize it. So we're approaching it in that way from an affordability. So you have a less of a time to accomplish your degree and obviously the less cost. Right, and this may be more relevant for Kaplan than for our mm -hmm. elite <laughs> brethren here. Um, but do you get the sense that, you know, there is an increased expectation uh, that uh, we're going to get some immediate outcome oh, here definitely. from the degree? Well, we, I mean, we're a data company, I'm sure, pretty much, but we're constantly saying, you know, what are the outcomes of the courses? We're assessing against that. We use net present value, I mean, the NPS scores to make sure that the students are getting one. We're working closely with the employers to make sure that we're delivering the students that are capable of working, so probably not dissimilar to what our, we're doing. Right. Yeah, I think through a combination of, of um, focusing on curriculum, focusing on innovation in and out of the classroom, and working really closely with recruiters, we can ensure that the, 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 the institutions, the brands that our students want to work for are the same brands that are lining up to interview them, to take them for internships, and to hire them ultimately. Mm -hmm. So when we do that well, we're able to use that that claim, you know, that, that brand promise of whatever it is, the percentage of, of students who, when they walk across that stage to grab their diploma, they've already got one or multiple offers from, from preferred employers. Right. So it's, it, it's a matter of getting out in front of it. Do, do, do you feel like employers, whether for the summer uh, or uh, upon, uh, upon completion, are looking 
uh, there's an, they're, they're looking for you know, some documentation of competency uh, on the part of the student. Do they want to sort of dig below the level of the transcript, if you will, double click yeah. on that degree to sort of understand what the competencies of students uh, are? When you get into this idea of competency, particularly in the MBA space, I mean, how do you, how, I think definitions become really important. Right. And so how, how would you measure resilience, right, or judgment? And, and so what employers are looking for are people who certainly know supply chain or who can, you know, create a net present value, but, but over the long haul, they're looking for somebody that can add value to their organization. And some of those things, you know, in the interactions that we have with employers are about, are we creating the types of graduates that fit with the types of, you know, those skill sets that, they're, that they most value? Yeah, I think, the, I think the employers that come to, to our schools uh, look at us and say, the, the university, the business school is functioning as a filter. Yeah. And we know that the, t the table stakes, the guarantee of looking through that resume book is that uh, these are, there's a very rigorous process to get into the school and a rigorous academic curriculum throughout. And, and I would echo um, Henry's comments earlier in the day where what they're really looking for when they hire is not necessarily competencies to fill a job that exists today. They're looking for leaders who can take their companies into a, a very unpredictable future with jobs that don't even exist today. Right. Mm -hmm. So, the, yeah, they have to be analytical, they have to be entrepreneurial, they have to have great leadership, teamwork, quantitative skills, but it's, it's also the, the, it's the EQ as much as the IQ that they're really looking for. Right, and arguably, some or much of that comes from, you know, students have that come on their way in, right? Mm -hmm. You're screening yeah. from that on the admission. We're screening for that already, and then they, they develop it further. Right. So what happens in some dystopian future <laughs> when those students are actually not opting to take on the debt and opting for some shorter, less expensive solution? Institutions? I guess what I'm trying to get to is, do you see a future where you know, Duke and UNC might have to move to a more competency-oriented approach to actually, you know, demonstrate. And even those competencies that are difficult to demonstrate, like resilience and grit and mm -hmm. so forth, have some measures so they can provide employers mm -hmm. some additional visibility as to the qualifications of, the, uh, of, your, of your graduates. Regardless of whether or not there's this dystopian future, I am very interested now in, in having us develop as an industry those types of competencies because I do think that you can be excellent in management. You could be excellent, you know, we were just speaking with a, a dean um, at a European business school last week who says, in the same way that you can be excellent as a medical doctor, we should be able to come up with some way to talk about a leader being excellent in that capacity and to be able to measure against those things. So I think that's very valuable for us in general. One of the concerns I have about a competency-based model is that if you think about it as the ability to kind of single stream off and develop, yeah. that kind of works against the teamwork and the ability to learn from others who are very different that then I believe sometimes stifles innovation. And, and so that's, I think, uh, I think we're invested in, in, in those things, and so that's where I think the competency-based model is not exactly a... Yeah, so two, right two right. things on that. I think the, one, of the mo one of the biggest um, hurdles that any MBA applicant faces and, and really weighs is the ROI of the degree. Right. And there's, there's a lot of evidence ac across the degree and, and certainly at specific institutions of the ROI of the degree. So it's, I don't think that we'll get to the point where they're unless something fundamentally changes in the, in the hiring market, um, and I think we've survived a big challenge in the last 10 years, uh, that we're, people aren't looking for, for MBAs. That said, we are looking for ways to develop competencies around things that are more abstract. For instance, we're working on um, global competencies, mm -hmm. and all business schools, and, and actually yep. Duke has one of the, one of the best um, global footprints, and. Uh, in our global footprint, in our programs, in our um, student experiences where they get to go and work and travel overseas and engage in corporations and in projects, that's not enough anymore. So what we want to do is figure out how can, you, how can you measure, how can you assess the competencies, what are the competencies, and how can you measure them. And it really is going to start from the day they walk in with kind of a baseline and then figuring out what are the courses all along the way, whether it's branding, or supply chain, and if these classes already have a component where they're talking about global branding or global supply chain, making sure that there's a competency component to that, yep. and then that rolls up when they walk out the That's door right. two years later, right. and they do have a sense, and the employer has a sense of how much exposure and how much competency have they accrued in something that's abstract as global. 
That's great. You so, want to add? Yeah, so we have a very, obviously, a different uh, student audience than you all do. And so many of our students are what was Zoe was referencing to do. So we definitely have an older population, you know, predominantly female. Most of them are working. Most of them are single parents. So they're coming at it very differently. We have instituted competencies. So what we're doing is we're building competencies, and we do have a competency report card or a transcript that we mm -hmm. give with all of our students. And we teach things around teamwork, around communication. And we do it as a maturation process so that every time you're taking a course, you're getting more and more. But as I said, you know, our students are looking, they're either in their jobs and want to increase their job or looking for a career change. So we have a different audience, so we're approaching it slightly different. Mm -hmm. Do you, how are your institutions using technology to improve the efficacy of your uh, of your program? Uh, well, both with you know students in on-ground programs as well as you know obviously UNC has a, a blended a blended program. There's a, a great um, so we have a partner Duke University has a partnership with the National University of Singapore um, for the med school, and there have been some innovations there that I think um, we might bring back if we haven't brought back already in the sense that they flip the classroom right yep. so the most expensive part of any education is the faculty member who's standing in front of you, um, and so they figured out a way to deliver part of that lecture through video. And then they took the remaining sort of what they saved in that time and used it to focus not only on sort of um, interactions with the faculty member, but then to add some team-based yep. clinical work, Active learning, yep. which is great. You know, accreditation is the same as it is in the United States. And so those are the types of things that I think are really, technology is a fantastic enabler if we can figure out ways to help it approve the efficacy of the product and maybe change the product itself. Yeah, any other thoughts? Yeah, and I would even go back even to what, what the focus of, of Elizabeth's job and my job is, is that the better that we can identify people who are really right fits for our program, the culture, the, the um, core concentrations that we teach, and, and, and ultimately the recruiters that we engage with, um, we're, we're tuning that audience mm -hmm. to succeed in our, in our um, environment. From a technology in the classroom point of view, I think there's two things that are that we really focus on. One is um, the LMS. We're always looking at opportunities, whether it's university-wide or within our school, to have the best possible LMS. And I think when when companies like Adobe and SaaS and others uh, continue to focus on the education market, we'll see integrations of CMSs mm -hmm. and LMSs and things that really change the game in terms of agility, personalized learning, and things that we can we can employ K through 12 and in higher ed. But the other thing is the, is the experiential opportunities for students to have real world learning experiences at the school. Things that are outside of the classroom that um, whether they're working in teams mm -hmm. or working in, on projects for, um, the, for the community or working with companies, those are the things that really um, develop them most and prepare them most for the outside world. That's great. And Terry, I know Kaplan's doing some gamification yeah, work. Yeah, we're, we're doing, I mean, technology yeah. obviously is our backbone. So yeah. we've got technology and force where we're doing, we call them externships as opposed to internships so that the students are actually working with companies, you know, virtually. We're using gamification in our classroom. We're using yeah. gamification in our career services to make sure that there's interactivity so the students can figure out where they want to go. So we're constantly innovating to figure out how to bring more um, cohesiveness and making sure that the experience and the teamwork is all working together. So I want to turn the conversation back to marketing. We just have over five, five minutes. So on the admissions side. So if you follow this logic, my logic, our logic of the competency marketplace through to its you know, <coughs> extreme, uh, and you believe that you know, students uh, in uh, high school, uh, for example, might begin developing their own competency profiles, and there's some reason to believe that. And you may have seen that the 80 institutions uh, last week that announced that uh, they're going to uh, essentially uh, adopt an e-portfolio uh, system and allow uh, students at the undergraduate level to submit uh, sort of e-portfolios for consideration uh, for, for, for admission. Um, you know, how does, that, how, how, do, how does that change how you think about, you know, the, the, the <laughs> your admissions, uh, admissions work where, you know, you have uh, inst instead a you know, comprehensive profile. You'll probably have more information than you'll know what to do with uh, on, uh, on on candidates, and sort of and, and 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 vice versa, right? They will on you, and presumably they'll have a sense as to you know, well, you know, this institution is good for taking you know a competency profile from A to B, but maybe not from X to Y, mm. uh, for example. Mm. So I think any think about that. I think any information that becomes available like that is at least for a public university is going to have to be completely available and and equally accessible 
to any kind of a student before an admissions department at a public university could say, that's, just, that's part of our consideration. That's exactly. If you grew up without Wi-Fi and you're in a house uh, and you don't have a computer or you can't afford this or that, right. um, you don't have access to a LinkedIn, you don't have access to building your profile or writing blogs, no, no, admissions, no admissions team is going to be able to qualify that as that's, that's data. That's a fantastic point. There was a critique immediately after that announcement of someone you know, facetiously posting a, a position, you know, $10,000 to develop your right. e-portfolio yeah. e, e profile admissions uh, right. counseling. That said, yeah. and that's different from social media, if, if it's, and there are examples of this that, that I've heard of at different institutions where um, someone's even admitted they do something really stupid, they post it on social media and, they, and the admission is rescinded. Yep. And that's different from having access to something, that's just a demonstration of poor judgment right. and the character of an individual. That's fair game, but using some data that some students might be able to perfect versus others who don't ha versus a lack of that opportunity for others, is, that's problematic, I think. What about non-public institutions or for-profits? For I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't think I've got an answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say, in general, and with with this and in many other domains, I think that all you know, it is really important that as we build our teams and we um, think about our work, that we are building in ways to learn. I mean, I can't tell you now that you know every year our, my job feels like a different job, yeah. and so how am I helping my team and my colleagues? think in these ways. I had to have somebody teach me Snapchat last night. I'm really embarrassed. <laughs> but, you know, but like how do we how do we just, you know, continue sure. to kind of push ourselves is I think the most important challenge for us. Yep. Yeah, I would agree with that completely and I would think it would just be transparency. It's transparency of what we're doing and the outcomes and the you know, our results so that the the student can make a ju sound judgment on what they're on what they're going to get and the value that they can put on it. Mm -hmm. right. Maybe one final final question go around. So, you know, if the if 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 the general uh, uh, critique and, and increasing focus uh, on our sector is return on student investment. What are one or two things that, whether your institution or all institutions could or should be doing to try to improve uh, that return and better communicate that to prospective students? Yeah, well, I, I get back to like, what's the definition of return on investment, okay. right? So you could say, I mean, there are there are certainly lots of MBAs who think the return on their investment is the starting salary, salary coming sure. out and whatever. There are lots of other, you know, MBAs who've been in the Peace Corps who now want to help improve water equality, like, you yeah. know. And so I think we get, it's a really murky to think about it in a very commercial model because as a nonprofit institution, we, we want to create knowledge, we want to make the world a better place. And so um, the extent that which we are continuing to make that work for the many different flavors of students who want to come to Duke, that's... Yeah, you know, where we'll be focused. That's great. Yeah. The go ahead. ahead. The yeah. go ahead. I, I would say that the, the one risk of, the, of a competency-based model is that the competencies are going to be different in the future. Mm -hmm. And when someone gets into their 10th, 15th, 20th year where they're in their prime earning years, uh, to sort of model their entire educational experience on the competencies that we have now right. is a risk because kind of like I believe in Mark Twain's philosophy of it, or his quote on education where he said, education is what you remember after you've forgotten everything you learned at school. And that, that's kind that's of, I think all of us can look back on our own education and say, we learned how to think. Right. And mm -hmm. if you learn how to think and learn how to be critical thinkers, mm -hmm. that's the best equipped uh, graduate that we can produce. Absolutely. No, I was just going to, I was going to say, I think our obligation is to teach the students, you know, how to think. Because ultimately, yeah. as you said, things are changing so quickly. If you can't so think fast. and you can't adapt, then you're not going to survive no matter what you're being taught. Yeah. So. Well, hopefully employers and students and our institutions will all agree uh, with that. Um, but anyway, well, this has been terrific. Uh, I want to thank the, uh, thank the panel. Thank terrific. You. Thanks thank very you. much. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.